We need to find a way to get in good trouble, necessary trouble, if we're going to save America. This is Paige. Welcome to the Necessary Trouble Show. Here's your host, my dad, Russell Fugit. Thanks, Paige. Welcome back to the Necessary Trouble Show. When you look at the Necessary Trouble Show logo, you'll notice the fist going up on the end of the logo. And this represents uh, Tommy Smith and John Carlos from the 1968 Olympics raising their fist on the medal stand. For those of you who know their story, you know that they were penalized when they returned back here to the States and their lives were changed forever. In the modern time, we have Gwen Berry, who's joining us today to tell her story. Just this past year in 2019, she uh, was on the medal stand in Lima, Peru. And during the national anthem, she chose to raise her fist in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. And today she's gonna share about her story and what's happened since that time. Gwen, thanks for joining us today. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. Um, I'm ecstatic. I'm, I'm just happy to be here. Well, I'm happy to have your voice uh, in this space on the Necessary Trouble show. Gwen, once you left the medal stand in that moment in Lima, tell us what happened. Um, once I left the medal stand, I feel like I didn't know um, what my stance meant. Um, I can honestly say that. Um, I didn't know how many people would see it. I didn't know what it would mean to people. And I didn't know, you know, the outcome of, you know, just the outcome of emotions, uh, good and bad. I didn't know what would come of it. And, you know, immediately I was punished. You know, um, I had to serve a suspension for 12 months. And, you know, other than that, I'll, everything that came with it was just amazing. Um, like mm. I said, good and bad. It was a, It was amazing. So I'm glad, I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I took my stand. Well, thank you for having the, the courage to do so. And you're a hero in, in my book for, for having that courage. Now, of course, since that time, um, obviously uh, the Washington Post and New York Times did a couple articles and stories about you which were very insightful and was how I personally learned to hear and learn about your story. I know in those stories, we learned that uh, you were a Nike sponsor athlete. And since that time, they have dropped you, but um, you've been now become the first sponsor athlete by color of change. Tell us about how that happened in, in terms of how Nike dropping you and then how you connected with Color of Change and, and what that relationship will yield for you going forward. Well, um, Nike dropping me was, again, just like uh, the USA Track and Field Foundation. It was just a phone call. You know, they called me and just told me that they didn't want to continue with me for the next year. And that was that. That was literally the conversation. We don't want to continue. Have a nice day. Um, same thing with the USA Track and Field Foundation. Um, they called me, they scolded me, they told me that I should never do that again, that they don't, they do not support, they did not support what I did and the stance I took on the podium. Um, and then they defunded me. So I think with that came, you know, I, I was kind of, you know, upset about that. I was sad about that. So I remember um, the up and coming months, you know, every, all the sponsors and all the major corporations after the death of George Floyd, they were trying to come out with these statements saying, you know, we support Black Lives Matter. We support the movement. We see what's going on. Yet they had dropped the very athlete who made a stance when it wasn't popular. So I really, um, I went back and forth with the foundation. I kind of, you know, took some jabs at Nike. And then I think um, with my receipts and with my proof that I was actually defunded and actually dropped from these corporations literally eight, eight months before, um, I think Color of Change saw that. And it was just like, hold on, wait a minute. This athlete was literally dropped eight months before all of this happened. And these companies have the audacity to say that they support these athletes. Like, it's just hypocrisy. So I think they reached out to me. Um, they heard my story. And they wanted to do everything to help me in my pursuit of becoming um, Olympic champion for Tokyo 2021. So Gwen, how is being uh, defunded by your sponsors uh, and, and even being suspended temporarily impacted your ability to train and prepare for 2021's Olympics? Oh, it impacted me um, pretty tremendously. You know, funding for Olympic athletes has always been scarce. Everybody always believes that Olympic athletes are rich or millionaires, and that's totally not the case. Olympic athletes, the reason why we can train and we the only way we are funded is through sponsorship. 
We are not paid. It is not a business. It is basically volunteer work. Honestly, you volunteer to represent your country, to show and prove that your country is the best country in the world. So losing my sponsors, you know, I wasn't able to pay my bills. I'm not able to take care of my family. You know, I'm not able to eat. So, you know, if I'm worried about those things or I have to work a job to fulfill those needs, you know, I'm working and not training. I'm working and not recovering. You know, I'm, I'm stressing about having to pay bills and I'm not thinking about what I need to do to master my event where my competition, they don't have to worry about those things. So being defunded by any sponsor is always horrible for any Olympic athlete. It can ruin their career. Right. So with that being said, I know you you shared that you're starting an athlete fund with Color of Change. Again, you're, you and Color of Change are pioneering this work. Tell us about that, that program. So with the athlete fund for Color of Change, because I was an athlete that was defunded, um, one thing that Color of Change is helping me do, they're trying to help me get more sponsorship opportunities so that I am able to pay my bills and able to focus on training. However, we are also trying to create an athlete fund. With this athlete fund, it is for athletes who do decide to protest or who do decide to use their platforms to make change or to bring awareness to things or social issues. And um, if they do lose sponsorship or funding, we're trying to help them with that. You know, pay their bills, you know, buy them food, do things to keep them able to train and able to focus on preparing for the Olympic Games. Wow. Well, I can't wait to, to learn more about that and, and find out how our audience can can support that fund, especially heading into to the Olympic uh, season in 2021. Uh, real quick, of course, uh, last week, you know, we got um, you know, news in the Breonna Taylor case. Of course, uh, since that time, has been more news um, in terms of uh, Vice News' report and of the police body cam footage, and you know, we're still pressing for justice for Breonna Taylor. Tell us a little bit about how, as a, as a Black woman, um, as a Black American, how that's made you feel in this moment. And, and some of the actions that you may be taking um, with color change or independently to continue to push for justice? Um, I definitely believe that it's devastating. You know, my heart goes out to her family, her friends, people who know her close. Um, I feel like it just speaks to the system. This system is not built for Black Americans. Um, and, you know, again, it speaks to the plight of the Black woman is the most disrespected, the most disregarded person on this planet Earth. And we should be held to the most, you know, we should be held higher than anybody. Um, I feel like it's a disgrace. Um, the system has failed us again. And that's exactly why everybody is protesting. Everybody is trying to create change. It's the system. It needs to go away. It needs to be burned down. And, um, you know, it's just devastating. It's just devastating to constantly see that Black people are always at the at the end of the totem pole and, and treat it as less than human beings. I feel you. It's, it's, it's painful. It's been a painful season, to say the least. And and we got to keep pushing for change. So how has this year been? Obviously, everybody's been impacted by COVID. Of course, the Olympics have been postponed. How has that been good and bad for you in terms of your preparation and even your eligibility to compete in Tokyo in 2021? Well, the good thing is um, I will be eligible. Um, I've started my 12-month probation. You know, the Olympic Committee did not know that COVID would happen. No one did. Um, right. As far as mentally, I feel like mentally this year has tested me. Um, as far as my motivation, you know, my flaws, things I need to work on with myself, emotionally, um, athletically. And, you know, I think it's hard for everybody because we, we don't have anything to quote unquote look forward to. So that really hurts athletes mentally. Of course, it's hurt me financially because I have no competition. So I really don't have a job. Um, I have no income. And um, yeah, 2020 has been a rough year. But I feel like through this year, you know, with my coach, my mentors, my family, my friends, you know, we've tried to stick together and just be positive and look forward to what we have to come. I know that's right. We're going to be rooting for you in, in 2021. Now, I want to take a step back and, and really uh, ask you, how did you arrive at the hammer throw as a competitive sport for you? How did you discover it? And, and, and how did you even get to the position you were in to be a 2016 Olympian and then compete in 2019 and looking forward to 2021? So this is always a crazy story. So I never threw a day in my life. I didn't know what throwing was. I never saw a shot put. I never saw a javelin, never saw a discus. But when I was in high school, I used to do the triple jump. So, you know, I've always been a good jumper, good at basketball. I was always that type of athlete. So when I went to college, because of triple jump, I had, they put me in the uh, multi-events. 
So in the multi events, you have to um, practice the shot put because that's one of the seven to eight events. So I used to go down with the throwers and throw the shot put, you know, probably like an hour, you know, just to get my technique and everything going because I never threw before. So the shot put coach, he used to always tell me, you know, you remind me of an athlete I used to coach. You remind me of an athlete I used to coach. And I was like, me? Uh, you know, I don't think so. And so he used to always beg my the coach that recruited me. He used to always beg him. He said, let her try the hammer. Let's put her in a hammer. Let's just let her try it. And I was just like, no, I'm not big. I'm not strong. I don't want to do it. I'm, I'm, I'm a smaller thrower. So I don't, I don't want to do it. I want to stick to jumping and I want to graduate. I want to be a world-class jumper. So this, the shot put coach told my recruiting coach who told my high school coach. So my high school coach got on me. He said, Gwen, this coach really believes that you can be a world-class thrower. You should try it. So I cried. I cried. I cried. I was like, I don't want to throw with these big girls. They strong. They've been doing this forever. I would have to play catch up. I don't have enough time. And he was just like, just try it. So I tried it. And literally three months into practicing the hammer throw, I almost made the junior Olympic team. So I caught on to it that fast. Wow. And just, you know, through repetition, through dedication, through persistence, and just making good decisions, you know, it allowed me to make the Olympic team. I just kept fighting. I just kept training. And I just kept working hard. That's an amazing story for our young athletes and our young women athletes to hear is, is, is being ready to do that, put in that work. How are, how are things looking for you for, for 2021? I know, I believe you were finished in 14th in, in 2016. I'm, I'm sure you know, it, was, it was nice to have that experience, but I'm sure you want to come mm -hmm. home with that medal and bring it home. How, how are you feeling looking forward to, to next summer in Tokyo? Um, Definitely. I feel like this year I have been training my butt off. I've done the hardest training I ever have in my life. I feel like, like my body is healthy right now. Um, me and my coach, we have changed my program. We are working on mastering this event, okay? We are working on mastering so that I can be on the top of that podium. I know that's right. But we're going to be uh, excited to see you there. How can people connect with you and find you online and, and support you in the work you're doing with Color of Change? Um, you can find me on Color of Change, so colorofchange.org. Um, you can find me on Instagram and Twitter. My ha my handle is Miss MZ Berry Throws underscore. And I'm starting to create a new website. All of my friends and my teammates have been probing me and priding me to create a website. So I will have a website up and running pretty soon. But Instagram, Twitter, that's what I'm on. And I would love the support. Well, thank you for, for, for your leadership. Thank you for following your heart. And thank you for continuing to do the work. And in this moment, I know it's hard and COVID and so many things have been turned upside down for so many of us this year. But thank you for being an example for all the black women and black girls out here um, who, who are looking for heroes. And, and there's so many of us um, who are looking to have daughters like I do, who are looking for heroes. And so yeah. I'm grateful for your leadership. Gwen, again, yeah. thank you so much for, for taking the time, for, for pulling over and taking minutes out of your day to share your story with us on The Necessary Trouble Show. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for watching The Necessary Trouble Show. Please visit NecessaryTroubleShow.com to support the show and to learn more. Subscribe to our e-newsletter and podcast and follow us on social media at Necessary Trouble Show. This is Paige. Thanks for watching.